the attendees a good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are uh, dialing in from. Uh, it is with great pleasure that uh, we'd like to welcome you to our first uh, you know, patient support webinar, which is going to be focused on patient-centric solutions, as uh, Sheena already outlined. My name is uh, Dr. Varun Sethi. I'm the Regional Vice President with DKSH, managing the Southeast Asia and Vietnam cluster for us. So it is my personal privilege to welcome all of you and my fellow uh, members on the panel to this, this webinar. Um, as many of you might know, DKSH, we are the leading market expansion uh, services provider within the, uh, the Asian context. And our, our mantra has been to, to deliver growth in Asia and beyond. And we are really looking forward to, uh, to sharing with you our understanding of you know, the patient support journey, the patient support programs, and bringing to you this first webinar around patient-centric solutions. So what we're gonna cover as part of um, you know, this next 60 minutes uh, between myself and our fellow uh, you know, members on the panel is to share some market trends and how technology uh, and the various platforms that are available right now are either acting as accelerators or enablers of this whole patient-centric journey. What does the future of this patient, uh, you know, this patient journey look like? And I think most importantly, as many of us are dialing in from Asia, it's important for us to understand, is Asia ready for this? So that's what we're gonna to try to answer over the next 60 minutes. I'd like to take um, a few minutes and just uh, welcome and introduce our three uh, panelists for this, uh, this webinar. So we have Jillian T, uh, who's joining us. Uh, she's the uh, CEO and co-founder of Homage. Homage is a senior home care solution provider that basically covers the, uh, the home environment for, for seniors through smart technology allows for them to age gracefully at home and provide them the dignity to be in their own home environment. Today, Homage is providing over 100,000 hours of home caregiving to seniors in Malaysia and Singapore and has raised 7 million uh, Singapore dollars from a variety of venture capital firms, including Golden Gate Ventures, Seed Plus, 500 Startup. Prior to jo joining and, and setting up Homage, Gillian was the co-founder for Rocket Trip, a Y Combinator, and December venture back tech startup company based in New York and Silicon Valley that raised 30 million. She's a Singaporean native and graduated from the University of Melbourne and the Columbia Business School. <clears throat> Our second panelist is Michelle Silva. Uh, he's the CEO and co-founder of Patient Centrics. Michelle basically co-founded Patient Centrics and provides technology to understand patient profiles better, patient centric personalized education that suits their needs and has got a significant example and, and experience working with various stakeholders in the healthcare systems and has co-authored a book on patient engagement for the life science industry. Uh, he is uh, a PhD in, in bioengineering from the University of Louvain in, uh, in Belgium. And lastly, we've got Jerome Pader. He's the, co he's the founder of Talos Health Systems. Talos Health Solutions uh, is, uh, is basically a healthcare web convention for chronic patient provider. It actually brings together healthcare professionals, caregivers, and also solution providers. Jerome received his doctorate in pharmacy and has worked for 17 successful years in the pharmaceutical industry as a managing director in Europe and in Asia. He's currently based in Europe, um, uh, based on the experience that he created and, and has conceptualized the triangle of compliance, which is what uh, you know, Talos brings to the surface. It reduces significant compliance risk at the affiliate level, he is partnered with a variety of UCB affiliates worldwide. Uh, Jerome decided to pursue his passion for developing patient-centric solutions, right, and that can possibly impact the life of patients and their families. So we're really looking forward to a very interesting discussion over the next 60 minutes, all right? Mark, can we move to the next slide? Where she compiled all the, all the uh, questions of I'm sorry. Uh, we really appreciate if everyone can put themselves on mute. Thank you. Now, there's a change, right? I mean, uh, and the, uh, the change is happening all around us, particularly when you look at what's the patient centricity model that used to exist in the previous, in the previous decades. It was very linear in its origin, right? So the pharma is going through the healthcare providers, going to the patients, and most likely going to hospitals and clinics. Today, it's actually migrating to become a fully integrated healthcare environment, right? And the consumers in Asia have basically got a lot more information and are engaged in trying to manage their own healthcare decisions 
And the stakeholders will actually evolve to create a fully integrated healthcare ecosystem environment. And a well-defined patient-centric digital strategy will likely help the companies build the consumer trust and gain those very, very key insights that are required to create loyalty for the brand. More so than ever before, science and the companies that actually are driving that science have to rethink their strategies. They need to recognize that the traditional strategies that they were utilizing is no longer applicable, right? The patients want to engage more with the physicians as they go through their journey of evolving into these disease states. They want to be a partner and they want to be able to weigh out the risk versus the benefits of not, um, of not utilizing certain therapeutic uh, segments. And this is where the, the use of patient advocacy groups, health plans, health systems, physicians, regulators, distributors, all these come together, pharmacies, they all come together to create this uh, unified, integrated healthcare ecosystem and the environment that's extremely critical. And, and mind you, if companies are not gonna evolve, right, they're gonna actually find themselves on the outer fringe, not being able to collaborate with these variety of stakeholders that's going to be critical, and it's going to be impossible for them to participate in this integrated healthcare system that will be driven by empowered and informed patients. So at this point, we'd like to actually poll you guys to understand, um, you know, is your organization well equipped to adopt this patient-centric approach that we are seeing evolve all around us? We'll give you a minute to actually quickly scan this, uh, this QR code that you see on your left. And, and, and give us your opinion through this poll. Varun, if I may, I will just quickly explain for those that maybe haven't done this before, you can sure, simply sure. point your camera at the QR code and um, your phone, your iPhone or your uh, phone will, will ask you to open Safari and you can then need to give it 10 seconds and the questions will show up and you can then reply. Thank you. Thank you, Sheena. Sheena, are we almost done? Um, yes, I think maybe give it another couple of seconds and then you can. I see it's really interesting how the bars are moving back and forth. I think we're good now and we can move on. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Sheena. So as we can see from, from this very quick poll of the audience, we've got about 50 odd people that are on this call right now. And we can see that about 60 odd percent of you think that your organization is at a three or above, right? So which is, which is a good start. What I'm going to do at this point is take the opportunity of, of passing the mantle on to our, um, our various panelists, right? So they can actually take a few minutes um, and introduce their, their organization and, and the kind of perspective that they have on patient centricity. So I'll start off with Jillian. Jillian, handing it over to you. Jillian from Homage, uh, over to you. Sure. Thank you, uh, Varun. Um, so, hello, everyone. Uh, it's great, great pleasure to be here. So, I'm, I'm Jillian, the founder of Homage, and uh, as Varun mentioned, uh, we are a caregiving and medical services platform, and currently operating in both uh, Singapore and Malaysia, uh, with three more countries uh, within Southeast Asia as in, in the pipeline over the next six months. So, a little about myself first. I think Homage um, really started uh, as I was looking for caregiving solutions personally for my, my mother and my uncle when I moved home from the US. Uh, both of them were, were living with chronic conditions. And I think that was when I, I personally experienced firsthand how painful and also difficult it was to get them the care that you know I was looking for, that they need. Um, and it also made me realize that traditionally there's been um, you know an important fo focus, but an over-focus on the acute and medical end uh, with the, with there being an, a corresponding need to also ensure that they were taken care of holistically, you know, enabling them optionality, I think, you know, to reside wherever they are. So 
this holistic nature of caregiving solutions is what I was looking for. And I started out to build a service and solution I was very much looking to use for myself. Um, and prior to homage, a bit about myself, I mean, I, I was living in the U.S. and running a travel tech company at the time. And that was also the time where I saw how technology was a key catalyst and enabler for many uh, industries, including caregiving and medical services, uh, decentralizing and also enabling, enabling scalability. So I wanted very much to develop a platform here in Asia uh, that could fill some of the gaps that I saw and and scale assess accessibility really to quality care uh, wherever someone is. Um, so I'm glad that you know today um, my, my 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 personal family members are using Homage and uh, you know looking forward to sharing more of uh, more more information and details and just my personal experience as well. So jumping into the introduction, so uh, just to double check, Sheena, are we moving straight into the the full introduction of the service at the moment, or are we taking care of that um, later on in this in the in the yeah, section? No, we can do that right now. Okay, sure. Yeah. So I think jumping in. Um, so as I mentioned, I think right now, fast forward to today, uh, Homage is Southeast Asia's leading tech enabled caregiving and health services platform. Uh, you know, over the last six months, particularly with the COVID environment, uh, we've uh, really scaled our b 2 b to c distribution. When we first started, you know, really I was looking at the underserved areas uh, specific to my own personal family members, uh, very much extending within our core services of what it means, you know, home personal care, uh, commonly known as ADL, activities of daily living. Put simply, it's just things that you and I need to do every day and we often take it for granted, but if you can't do it, you can't, you know, and you need this assistance, you can't function independently or live independently at home. And so we really, um, you know, for example, with my uncle living with stroke, uh, what was a need for his, for, you know, what was a key need for, for him was to ensure that he could still do, perform his daily activities uh, within his own home. And he wanted very much to still, uh, you know, recover and live well at home. Um, but because he was unable to orally feed, um, he was he needed nursing services alongside that. Beyond that, you know, chronic illness is is longstanding and it, it takes takes it's a journey. It's you know, and, and any any different any point given point in time, the needs can change and be different. And so, you know, he very much needed uh, physiotherapy for recovery, uh, but uh, also a need for for someone when when I was traveling to take him to the hospital for uh, you know for medical appointments, health screening was a need, and so it was very challenging to find a solution that could you know very much create this interoperability between the primary care setting, the acute care setting, and very much as as a primary caregiver myself, I was kept in the dark, so the experience was highly manual um, with homage. That was what we started out to do. Uh, over time, we learned that those needs extend beyond just the community, direct to families. We learned that um, you know there was a huge need to support organizations with uh, you know, enabling their their delivery at home as well, uh, even enabling the the with the care worker shortage, enabling these services within any facility. Uh, but importantly, ensure that there is a continuity and a seamlessness between uh, each setting of care. So one of the key things that we do is as well as enable what we call a, uh, you know, a, a medical point to point concierge and service. Beyond that, we, we realize just like myself, you know, I'm not within, you know, my background is not in healthcare, And like many people out there, when 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 there is a chronic condition or a ailment or or, you know, an illness that they're experiencing, they often require some assistance on defining a care plan and understanding what's required. And so uh, what's key was really enabling that medical concierge and what we call a care advisory uh, uh, team to help uh, triage needs and enable awareness and education. Uh, very fundamentally, this has actually been translated into distribution of our services across different kinds of uh, segments, very much working with the government uh, especially during this this period of time and, and you know where we're supporting the nation's effort to fight the pandemic uh, on the healthcare end we partner with hospitals as well uh, and of course uh, it has been you know in a number of very interesting collaborations and partnerships with 
with uh, uh, partners in the pharma space, uh, as well as those who have been, you know, have such innovative product developments on a number of different kind of wearables that can support different critical illness pathways. Beyond that, um, we have also been partnering with corporates. Uh, you know, so I think that's that's one key <coughs> highlight. Yeah. So um, at this point. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry, can I just uh, request for, thank you, appreciate it. Uh, so uh, at this point, we have scaled up to, our model's a bit different. We don't just allow any provider to list on our platform. So we it's highly curational and we use technology to power very much the supply chain. And so at this point, we are the largest pool of fully screened and curated uh, licensed care professionals, encompassing nurses, caregivers, doctors, as well as uh, rehabilitation ter therapists. So moving on to the next slide, um, really, I think what's really powering this end to end is technology. And that's really key because technology, one of the experiences that I had was when I was looking for services and solutions, I was very much kept in the dark. So how technology comes in was to help help me understand, you know, um, how I can easily access and book care all the way down to scheduling logistics payments. The last thing I wanted to be bogged down by was all of the administrative aspects. So the technology is meant to be an enabler that can uh, augment between the caregiver, the person entering the home, you know, to the care recipient. Homage is the care, you know, the, the healthcare practitioner, the, the doctor uh, entering the home, providing the teleconsultation. Um, and uh, uh, over time, we've also built enterprise technology and the solution to help our partners in a number of different use cases, I think that's uh, expressed in the next, the next uh, yeah, slide. Chilean, if I can get you to speed up a little bit, uh, probably in the sure. next minute, if you can wrap up, yeah. Thanks. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. So um, here, I think here, you know, it's just a key point here that we we partner with different segments of of uh, our partners, uh, helping them scale their workforces as well as service scalability. Uh, importantly, we've added on top of the homage care arm. Um, what we call a homage health uh, segment, which uh, adds on top the needs for medical services, including teleconsultation, medication delivery. So I think I'll pause here. I think the final slide, you know, um, is to really just talk about the journey that I've experienced personally, where we're looking at uh, this huge surge of needs uh, driven by chronic conditions and. Um, you know, I, I'm looking forward to sharing more of how homage comes into play with, with just that patient experience that I personally, you know, went through, and and that you know, with the with with this uh, a high growth of uh, the advent of chronic conditions, I think we're seeing more and more needs being brought from the hospital to the community setting. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you for. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Appreciate it. Uh, we're going to switch over really quick to Michelle Silva from Patient Centric. So, Michelle, if you can just quickly give us an overview about what your platform does. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Varun, uh, for uh, the introduction and uh, for uh, inviting me. Um, so, uh, indeed, so Patient Centric is a company that I founded uh, several years ago, and at the end, it also started uh, like uh, uh, Gillian. Um, uh, because of my personal experience. So about, uh, I think, 10 years ago, I was uh, myself diagnosed uh, with uh, a chronic disease, uh, some more specific uh, eGPA, which is a kind of autoimmune uh, disease. And um, I actually went through several clinical trials and I experienced um, uh, how it really is um, yeah, to actually be a patient and to go through all these care paths. And there it was very clear that uh, although I consider myself as a, an patient, things could be better. Um, so um, in the beginning, so I was actually doing, uh, when I got my diagnosis, uh, a PhD in bioengineering. Uh, so I always had this little uh, um, geeky side, let's say, and, and passion about uh, healthcare monitoring. Uh, and over the years, we actually um, uh, got more and more um, in touch with uh, both patient organizations, uh, um, research institutes, uh, universities, uh, also a lot of pharma industry, actually. And um, over the, the last um, uh, three years, we have been really specializing in these patient-centric models because uh, uh, we used to hear that, um, okay, patient centricity, the new trend in healthcare, uh, it is becoming more and more like, okay, patient engagement, and mm. now uh, the big trend is to become patient-driven. Uh, so, but what are all these different definitions? Because uh? uh, at the end, if we really look to what does patient centricity mean, it's about involving patients uh, all in the beginning when you are creating your services, your medication, uh, what 
sure you have the right support systems that are also patients, so you transfer value as much. Uh, so you can go to the next slide. Um, Mitchell, uh, Mitchell, if I may uh, quickly interrupt you, I think we're having a little bit of challenge with your yeah. voice. Would you mind turning off your video because I feel that might improve your bandwidth? Yeah, thank okay. you. Thank you, Shina. Thank you. So sorry about that. I hope this is better. It's better. It's better. So, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Varun. Um, so, uh, as Varun mentioned in the introduction, I actually wrote a book. Um, I quoted the book about uh, patients' interest in the life science. As um, we often don't really think about it in a structural way, as an organization, as a pharma company, what can you actually do structurally, culturally, to make it happen? Uh, and uh, one of the very important um, aspects where we focus on in our organization is uh, to make sure that whenever you are developing your medication, uh, your support services, whatever it is, uh, you should involve the right patient at the right moment uh, in order to make sure that you really capture uh, the values, uh, whether it is uh, assessing, for example, secondary endpoints in drug development, until making sure you are educating the patients in the right way because um, you might maybe see that they don't actually capture everything that you would like them to capture because they just don't see it. And you see it differently from a professional perspective. Huh? So this means there's a gap. Uh, and in order to bridge this gap, uh, it's very important to understand when do you actually reach out to patients and how do you reach out to them. Uh, and a patient is um, uh, can be a patient uh, that you actually can, uh, let's say, connect to on the virtual networks. Uh, uh, you can also have patient experts, uh, patients that have been um, in the ecosystem so long, so they really understand the complexity uh, of the ecosystem. They understand a lot of the, uh, the challenges and they can actually communicate in a very efficient way uh, with different stakeholders to make sure that um, the patient perspective is brought into account in the early stage. Uh, and um, of course, uh, where we also focus on uh, is to see how can you make sure you make the right partnerships, for example, with patient advocacy groups, etc., and uh, bring this into your company at the right moment um, to make sure that you are really uh, patient driven. So uh, besides actually the, the insights that we generate, uh, so indeed you can go to the next slide. Um, we actually also develop uh, technology and uh, technology um, is really at the end all about empowering patients. Um, and when we look to patient empowerment, the model that we use uh, is that uh, uh, you should actually promote uh, shared decision making. Uh, you should promote self-tracking and you should promote uh, the way patients uh, receive information. And this we actually translate into uh, different type of applications uh, that are used uh, both for by the lay public uh, as in a clinical setting, as um, in, um, uh, in, in universities uh, for, for research, for example. Um, so the first one is actually uh, Empower Me. And um, if you go to the next slide, um, this application is really about educating patients uh, in the right moment in their care path. And because um, we see, for example, in oncology that um, when you prescribe patients oral chemotherapy, um, the uncle nurse or the, the oncologist uh, explain when they should actually take the medication, how much they should take. Um, if you ask um, uh, a few minutes later, okay, when should you take and how much should you take? 60% are off. Uh, of course, you can imagine there's a lot of uh, stress at that moment at the patient, so they don't uptake all the information. Uh, so what we actually do is we try to gamify the way you can actually provide this information to the patient. Uh, so there's like a quiz kind of uh, um, uh, um, uh, or technology in there. Uh, and at the same time, we have actually uh, what we call the, the Tinder-like uh, swipe left, swipe right kind of approach to actually capture uh, the impressions of patients throughout the care path to reconstruct the, um, the patient journey. Uh, so by actually having this tool into place both in the cl clinical setting as in uh, a setting um, at home, uh, we are able to, to reconstruct the patient journey and uh, to actually pick out what is needed to improve whatever service we are developing. So we can go to the next one. Uh, another tool is actually um, a tool which is more used in the clinical setting uh, for patient education, uh, but also combined with uh, prompt tracking, uh, patient reported outcomes. Uh, patient reported experience. Uh, so here uh, the system allows uh, patients to uh, enter their side effects and depending on the intensity that they report and their side effect, uh, they will get uh, personalized education. Uh, so it's really fine-tuned uh, to actually what uh, intensity the, the patients are reporting. All of this is uh, directly um, linked uh, with the, the healthcare professionals 
Uh, so the Oracle nurses, uh, this is actually a tool implemented in oncology at the moment. Um, and um, so the Oracle nurses and the oncologists can actually track the patients over time and um, to uh, make sure they can contact them if needed. Uh, and at the end, it's also about uh, making sure patients get all the information uh, when they log in about uh, uh, how to deal with certain side effects. And then uh, the final one is actually uh, uh, communities. Uh, so we create uh, temporary communities uh, where we can actually bring patients together to discuss about certain topics, which is moderated. Because um, we know that uh, when patients have questions, um, they will go to other patients, uh, other patients' answers. And this is actually a very interesting process because you actually start um, infecting, let's say, uh, uh, ideas uh, so in a positive way. Uh, so uh, you get inspired to ask other questions. And this really helps you uh, to uh, walk the, the, the patient's uh, journey uh, to become more empowered. So uh, this was actually it. Uh, so. Um, uh, if you have any questions, please visit the website or you can always contact me. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Really appreciate it uh, for walking us through, you know, what patient centric does. And lastly, now we're going to switch over to, to Jerome Pradier to, to talk to us about Talos uh, Health Solutions. So Jerome, over to you. Jerome, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me now? Now we can. Go yes. ahead. Well, I, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I want to thank first TKSH for this opportunity to introduce Talos. Then Talos has been uh, developed based on uh, what also I've heard from, uh, from the two first speakers about my personal but also professional experience. I have met uh, some patients uh, due to my uh, professional activities in Asia and Europe. Um, and also as uh, uh, personally uh, family caregivers, I have also experienced the need, in fact, to have an easy access to uh, relevant information, current and relevant information. Um, that's, that's why we have developed a platform that uh, allow us uh, to organize a web conventions with no limit uh, in terms of participant, providing an access to uh, key opinioners, patient experts, uh, but also providing uh, and exchanging uh, some experience with uh, the, a large community. Uh, next slide. Then um, the best way um, uh, to, uh, for me to introduce what we do is uh, for you to, um, uh, to understand um, what is uh, a virtual and immersive environment. And I suggest you to watch a video that we are using to promote a current conventions that is now uh, online uh, in the US targeting uh, patients and family caregivers in, the, in asthma. actually a person wheezing. We're going to play it for you again and see if you can pick up on that. My name is Sanaz Aftakari with the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America. Then um, this technology um, uh, has been developed to answer one of the key uh, issues that chronic patients uh, and loved ones are facing, is to find relevant current uh, information and not to have to go, uh, maybe next slide, uh, to go on the web and uh, try to identify what is good, wrong. Uh, and today, uh, what we call cyberchondria, it's uh, an emotional uh, dissemination of thoughts uh, in social media. Uh, creating stress, tensions, uh, just because people do not have the expertise, uh, the time to identify what is right or wrong uh, on the web. Then, uh, next slide. Then, that uh, immersive environment uh, allows us to uh, provide, provide an easy access to the information, uh, but also for those attendees to also um, identify the source of that information. It is totally adapted to the agenda. That's mean we pre-record videos, even if we have developed some tools that uh, allow interactions on our platform, but patients can go and come back again any times uh, to go and see uh, the videos what, wherever they are, because the family caregivers can be also on the other side of the planet and caring for someone that is very far away. 
then during a certain period of time, and in the case of Azmatcon right now, that is going to be uh, ending at the end of the month of July, people can come, gather information during, during uh, uh, some weeks and sometimes some months. Uh, they get access to key opinioneers, which is um, impossible to have in a normal, uh, normal situations, patient expert, but also through polls, um, uh, surveys, and also sending questions that we are collecting, they can uh, interact with the community. Um, our main objective is to provide a simple, actionable information to empower and, uh, and, and for those patients to act upon their uh, quality of life. Um, what we do also is that we are partnering with the third party companies, uh, providing um, uh, uh, and collecting uh, data uh, totally anonymized we are GDPR and HIPAA compliant uh, in a way that we can analyze those data, getting access to soft data from that community and uh, that we share with our partners in a way that we can understand uh, better that community, their needs and their expectations. The access is free of charge. There is no limit of number of attendees and that's what makes it uh, very different with what we are currently seeing where a lot of websites are facing erosions uh, due to the fact that patients do not go permanently to get to try to get uh, more accurate information or uh, uh, current information. Well, that's thank you very much for uh, for listening. Listening. Thank you, Jerome, uh, and really appreciate all the three uh, panelists for sharing the background on their organizations. Right, I think uh, each one of you have talked about in particular you know, what is going to be the, the future of the patient journey. I think this all comes down as, as the final crux, right, that there is going to be a change in the way we look at, you know, the overall patient journey from, uh, from end to end. Right. So if you can go to the next slide, Sheena, just to kind of share, you know, how, um, how COVID-19, you know, as a pandemic has greatly affected the way we live our lives, right? All of our lives have been modified in one way or the other, whether we have uh, taken the access to healthcare or not, and the way healthcare is delivered is also changed more than ever actually in this particular current environment. And the patients, many of us actually might have uh, loved ones who have been patients in the, in the near past in the last 90 to 120 days. And we've relied on a lot of digital channels. I know I have personally as well, when I've had to, uh, to, to look at healthcare, right? And how it's being delivered. And more and more remote solutions, remote diagnostic tools, whether telemedicine, all these elements have now come to the forefront more than ever they have in the past you know, decades that people have been trying to push them through. So it's been a great pivotal point. Uh, if one can look at, you know, what the positive impact has been from a COVID-19 standpoint, despite all the negativity that we have seen around us. And we see, we see a dramatic shift, right, in the consumer behavior and more willingness to embrace digital and remote solutions. And as part of those solutions to cater to their various healthcare needs, right? And we see how a variety of different organizations are playing a critical role in this entire, uh, what we would say the future patient journey would look like, right? This new environment is, is paramount to, to craft out the right kind of solutions and strategies to understand how this will uh, impact the patient's centricity, right? At this point, we'd like to run another poll, uh, now that we've got a, a healthy audience here, to see which point along this patient journey you believe your organization or brand is focusing on. We'll take another 60 seconds, allow everybody to vote and for those of you who joined late uh sheena if you can just quickly uh give another recap of how we can use this this, this yes application. of course you can simply open your camera and basically take a picture of the of the qr code and your camera will open a uh, link a safari to safari um or to a browser and you can answer the questions there thank you thank you sheena Okay. Well, thank you. This is uh, this is very helpful, right? I mean, this definitely gives us a good perspective that pretty much nobody is using it for testing modalities right now, which uh, 
uh, which is not completely surprising, but for the others, I think it's, it's quite telling. So what, I, what I'd like to do is, is go along in our, in our conversation and, and kind of bring our panelists back. And, and, and the question that I want to pose to all of you, uh, Jillian, Michelle, and Jerome, is, you know, what are some of the key learnings? I mean, all of you are from a health tech startup um, you know, environment. And how do you see this patient journey from your perspective, you know, evolving? And, and what do you think your company's uh, solution or response has been uh, specifically to meet this uh, evolving patient journey that we are seeing these days. So I'll start off with you, Jillian, uh, and um, uh, your, your, your thoughts on that. Sure. Uh, thanks, Varun. So I think one of the key developments that we've seen uh, in delivering care to, to care recipients uh, on the ground is that there has there's a shift of increased need for augmentation between offline and online solutions. So, um, you know, it's very clear to us that there are many needs that can be uh, met through a digital delivery channel. So when you look at non-urgent needs, for example, uh, a, you know, a chronic uh, condition review that requires a medication refill, um, those needs actually are very well suited for a digital channel because, you know, you, you, you save a trip to the clinic and, of course, you also uh, risk lower the risk at this very given time, which is more relevant, lower the risk of infection. And, you know, you save that sort of wait, wait time as well. And particularly with, mo with mobility constraints, if you're uh, not very mobile or have some level of disability, um, digital channels can be a great fit. But we've also seen that specific with the elderly population and how that, that segment has been growing, you know, uh, so rapidly, uh, many of the needs do need to integrate with an offline delivery channel. So if there was an unknown pain, for example, a recent fall, a fracture, uh, all of those that can be seen within the home setting. And then there is another tier, which is, okay, this is where it needs to be escalated to an acute setting. So I think this uh, rise of the home economy, I think, you know, it's, it's, it, there, we do see this, this, this huge growth and surge in needs with home-based services. Um, but I, but I also see that the need for triaging between a digital as well as an offline channel and bridging this offline to online gap is an expanded opportunity um, to better need, meet the needs of, uh, you know, a patient journey and the user journey. Uh, so that's one. And maybe just to point out another quick one, a quick, quick observation um, is so, so, I mean, I guess one of the ways that Homage has responded in that is, is for example, with, with just for looking at the rehabilitation segment that we have where we, where we provide physiotherapy or speech therapy, uh, there are hallmark sessions that we, we hold in person, but we also enable the delivery of teleconsultations for this, for these therapy uh, services. And that's just one example with the health side for medical doctors. They go into the homes when there's a need, but uh, with other times where needs are less emergency, less urgent, uh, they deliver it through a teleconsultation. So, um, uh, I think that's one of the ways that we've res responded, uh, particularly during this COVID environment, where you know that there is that that move and acceleration to your point uh, of Arun on on you know a, a growth in popularity of digital tools. I believe so. So that the adoption rate we've seen in terms of you know teleconsultations have greatly greatly increased, and I do believe that you know particularly with with brick and mortar uh, businesses and large offline businesses and sectors would, would, would accelerate digitization efforts in light of the limitations of just pre predominantly offline centric models. So, so that's just some, some, some thoughts here um, from my end. Yeah. Thank you, Julian. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, Michelle, anything from your end? Yeah, so um, I think uh, very in line actually with uh, what uh, Gillian said. So, um, what we actually see is that uh, what we achieved over the last uh, two, three months, uh, we could not achieve uh, on the last uh, three, four years, let's say. So I think uh, the whole COVID situation has really, um, yeah, it gave us so many new opportunities and uh, we actually really see the benefit of uh, digital technology and how it can actually really improve quality of life of patients. Uh, and because uh, a nice example is uh, uh, people that are on a biologic drug that have to go to the hospital uh, for their injections, uh, mostly monthly or um, every few weeks. Um, there's a big question, okay, um, should I actually go? Will I get a higher chance of being infected uh, with COVID? Um, and we actually see this in other 
type of consultations as well, where patients say, look, I would like to maybe um, be careful and let's just delay the consultation. Of course, this is not positive because this will cause um, maybe the disease uh, to just uh, go on, uh, uh, increase uh, certain, um, uh, certain symptoms over time. Um, so uh, uh, how we responded is actually uh, to really build in a kind of um, a more information um, tool actually based on certain questions uh, to uh, assess, okay, uh, can you actually at this moment really postpone your treatment, yes or no, um, and also bridge you directly with the right uh, person within the hospital. Because um, we really know that um, yeah, informing patients is, is critical. And I think when we look to the whole uh, patient journey, how this is evolving, uh, it's um, something that's very dynamic. Uh, so uh, a patient journey that uh, you capture at one moment in time, um, if you would do this uh, today uh, during the COVID and compare it with the patient journey in the same clinical setting a few uh, years ago, it will be completely different. Uh, it's a really a dynamic thing. And I think more and more both um, yeah, uh, healthcare uh, providers, um, research institutes and pharma, they actually see this now. And uh, I think where it's all going to is um, towards this more and more personalized um, um, yeah, education at the end. Like we have precision medicine, we have precision education. Uh, this means that uh, we really have to tailor uh, the needs and the information we provide based on the individual patient um, indicators that we can capture at that moment. And this is why I think the, the solutions uh, that we see out there and what also Gillian mentioned uh, are actually key to make this all happen. Um, and I think this is a good trend. It will be challenging because uh, uh, not everyone is digital. Uh, we actually recently did a survey um, on a very big pool of asthmatic patients. And uh, what we actually saw was that uh, the, the biggest preference of receiving information was still having a brochure by the physician um, during the consultation. Uh, while we are in 2020, um, where you could uh, assume, uh, and this was the assumption of one of the industry behind this survey, uh, was that, uh, okay, people uh, would like to have push digitally via application. Uh, what is interesting, if you go deeper, you start to identify the different patient profiles. Uh, right. And this is, I think, where we really have to go to is understand what patient profile do you uh, approach, how, and, um, and, and when in the patient journey. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. I appreciate it. Uh, Jerome, uh, uh, your thoughts, yes. please. Um, our experience is, um, has been made also uh, through a survey that we did in 20 European countries um, regarding three different therapeutic areas, where we have seen that um, patient associations were representing just only 5 to 10% of the patients. This means there is a large group of patients that are not involved or don't even know that there is a patient association. And those people, depending on uh, their financial resources, uh, but also their physical capacity, um, will not attend any physical conventions to be able to get access to relevant information. And that's what we can see across the board. And currently, uh, we have developed also um, um, the company uh, in the US. And uh, I have experience um, uh, with the Parkinson patients, for example, that they just don't know where to get access to information and how to build awareness. And it's not just only about the patients. And that's where uh, with Talos we are focusing on, is also to involve the family caregivers. I have personally lived that experience uh, myself as a family caregiver, where you know, I have the frustrations and the will to find uh, how I can help. And uh, sometimes you just don't know where to go. You get access to uh, what your uh, doctors or nurses is, is telling you, but you would like to have more and to understand also how, as, um, as in being involved, I can uh, put some positive pressure on the ecosystem um, without having to share my names and, uh, and be an identified. Um, and that's what I have uh, very regularly experienced with all the patients and family caregivers that I've seen. On top of that, in this today world, family, family are spread out around the world. Uh, and it's not because you are far away that you just don't want to be involved. And building awareness and providing uh, actionable information is a must. If you go to some website uh, in the US, for example, there are so many information that this is depressing. You don't know what is the information that you need, what can be uh, helpful, what are the other doing, should I reinvent the wheel on everything that I'm going to do? That's why having the opportunity to be all together to, uh, uh, in a, a convention center, uh, it's a way to have uh, 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 access to that information and to have access to the top leaders that is going to provide you some easy to understand uh, and actionable information. 
But on top of that, um, you want to put positive pressure. That's been when you reach uh, a critical mass during those conventions, uh, this is um, attracting the attentions of the authorities, but also patient associations and, uh, and healthcare professionals. And that's what is needed is to have a direct uh, contact with those people and to understand that it's not just about the treatment, but to understand the overall situations and what can I do to help those patients. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Jerome. Uh, and thank you to Julian and Michelle as well. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to move on. We've got about 15 minutes left, and we've got still uh, one part to cover. So I think the, the biggest question I'm sure that's on everybody's mind right here is, uh, is this Asia ready? I think if you look at the entire continuum of care that we have talked about and all the various stakeholders involved, I think the, the pertinent question here is to try to understand what are those barriers to implementing these patient-centering approaches. So we're going to take another poll, actually, and, and get a, a sense from our audience here. Uh, so let's just follow the same methodology. Maybe I'll just recap again for those that are not sure. You can use your camera on your mobile phone and scan the QR code. It should take you to a survey where you can answer the questions. Thanks. Okay, I think we'll, we'll move on. I mean, as, as people continue to keep doing this in the interest of time, uh, I have one last question for our panelists on this, right? I mean, in, what do you think, uh, if you can go on to the next uh, slide, uh, Sheena. So what do you think are, are the real uh, challenges or the main challenges and barriers that we, that we foresee, right, to getting stakeholders, including various government agencies or regulatory agencies, to focus more on the patient? Everybody talks a lot about the patient. But what do, you, what do you think are the real barriers? So we'll start off uh, again with Jillian. And just in the interest of time, Jillian, let's kind of keep it tight to about two minutes, yeah? Sure. So I think the key challenge here, um, maybe I'll speak on, on some of the uh, Southeast Asian countries. Um, I think with regards to, to focusing more on the patient, um, I think predominantly it's this, you know, there's been a tradition of just focusing on um, internal capabilities and your niche. So your, you know, what you're good at. And I think the pandemic actually has exposed the limitations of, you know, for example, just focusing on public sector resources um, with private companies stepping up to provide these essential goods and services to, to the population. Uh, so I would say one of the key things is just the lack of structures for us to pull down that wall garden and and partner so because without proven models of a private public partnership um you know there there, there is nothing to go by so as, as sort of more traditional risk of us you know how do we then uh, enable programs and initiatives that can drive awareness of need for for different kinds of collaborations and ensuring that the the delivery within these service categories can actually lead to real outcomes i think um, you know, I, I have seen actually very positive signs in the last six months of higher, higher collaboration in Asia. And I think that shift is very much driven by just the understanding that one solution needs to, you know, uh, uh, tie together various different parts. Um, and uh, one, one other key point is that <laughs> we do see this shift where the consumer wants to make more of a choice. So they they want to select their solutions there. Um, and so it's moving towards more of a, instead of a top-down prescriptive kind of approach, but a part, almost a partnership with the clinician and different, different stakeholders. So the needs for presenting that United Front is much higher. And I think uh, various healthcare providers are recognizing that that is the need coming from, from the patient, from the customer. And, and so that, that in many ways drives um, higher willingness for interoperability and building up that that uh, that journey and you know the integration and so even sometimes it involves systems integration between different healthcare platforms towards a common use case. So um, I do see very positive signs of that in Asia. Thank you, thank you, Julian. Uh, Michelle, your thoughts? 
Yeah, I uh, actually also uh, would like to go along those lines. So uh, I think that the collaboration is key. Yeah? Um, there at the end, a lot of different solutions uh, that uh, each of them would like to uh, handle one issue or problem or challenge. Uh, and the question is, how can you make sure that you have a continuum of care, a continuum of solutions that can actually bring value at the end uh, to the patient? And um, I think it's very important to really understand who are all the stakeholders involved when you are bringing your solution. Uh, and so often I refer to patient centricity as multi-stakeholder centricity, uh, where you have the patient as one of the equal partners. Uh, if your solution uh, involves nurses or physicians and you don't really capture the value for those nurses or physicians, the system, your solution will not work. Uh, it's really key to really understand how you can bridge all of this uh, and understand the value for each of these stakeholders. Um, and together with this, I think uh, to enable this, uh, you have to understand the needs. And this is where, again, co-creation with patients in a very early phase is important. Uh, make sure you have access to the right patients. And this is on itself a challenge uh, to see, okay, where do I find the right patients to uh, co-create my solutions? Um, and I think uh, this is a really good starting point for a lot of companies and where we see a lot of changes happening uh, on a global level. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michel. Jerome, your thoughts? Yes. Um, one other thing that we have experienced uh, is that, uh, for example, as a government, they have so many patient associations trying to attract their attention. And most of the time, they are very small, not particularly professionals, and they do not provide uh, relevant data. Uh, governments and stakeholders, you know, run by data. Where we should invest, what should be uh, the action that will be cost effective, in fact, to uh, really uh, get some results. And, um, and we see that um, most of the times, um, the, the um, all of those patient associations and I, and I think about patient associations to be more developed and uh, more capable in fact to attract the attentions of all those stakeholders but this is most of the time uh, not happening and uh, where we can uh, change uh, the situations is being able to provide uh, those data uh, we need to be able to provide these informations in a way that we then uh, attract the attentions of all those stakeholders uh, for them to act uh, upon upon uh, providing um, uh, new uh, new support and uh, and new solutions, and that's what we can really um, uh, see uh, in what we do. Um, we have that experience um, uh, in different countries where, um, in what we do, uh, we have been able to have the government supporting uh, our activity uh, and conventions. Um, because that's a way to reach out the uh, enormous quantity of patients that will never be part of any uh, other things. And uh, and what do they think? What are I expecting? What you know? What can we do? In fact, and sometimes we are wrong in uh, believing that uh, the main focus uh, uh, or the main expectation of those patients are this particularly need is because we are not um, asking the questions to the large amount of patients that are facing day-to-day -day, uh, issues. And it can be just doing grocery shopping. You know, uh, maybe the disease is something that they are controlling, but in their day-to-day -day, uh, activity is just to be able to uh, help the kids to go back to school every morning uh, or just to do grocery shopping. And that's something, unfortunately, that uh, we don't have uh, those data and there are means today with the digital uh, tools uh, to collect this quantity of data that will help those stakeholders to be sure that whatever they're going to do, there is this, this is going to be cost effective. No, actually, it's, uh, it's very well said. Again, I want to thank all three of you for your thoughts. I mean, just mine as we wrap up and, and, and go into some Q&A. I mean, it, it all comes down to, um, I think, as you said, you know, collating all this together. And, and uh, if we look at it from a phase perspective, right, it's, it basically is patient monitoring, uh, looking at, you know, what those outcomes are, what are we trying to drive towards, how do we communicate that better to the various stakeholders, whether it's the payers, whether it's the insurance companies, whether it's the government stakeholders. And at the end of the day, looking at the patient convenience, as you rightly said, Jerome, even something as simple as going about, you know, with the regular quality of life, right, whether it's grocery shopping or whether it's going out and doing your daily chores, I think it also is important from a patient education standpoint, right? So the disease awareness, the ability for us to be able to uh, influence those outcomes, understanding what some of those risk factors are, are really important and being able to communicate that to the, to the various stakeholders. So I think it all comes together very nicely in that ecosystem that we have talked about. And not, no single player today has that seamless integration. And I think 
I think Jillian, you may, you mentioned it correctly, uh, where the system integration on the back end also becomes equally important. Everyone's working on different platforms. How do we actually create that unified approach, providing at the end of the day the benefit to the patient journey? So again, I want to take this opportunity to thank um, you know all three of you, uh, the panelists. Uh, thanks for taking the time, sharing your your insights. And we've got about uh, five minutes before we have to wrap up at the top of the hour. So, Sheena, um, any questions that we have uh, from so the audience, audience. That, uh, we can um, we can help yes. our panelists answer. Yes. Hi, Varun. Thanks. Um, I will jump to one that I think might be interesting for most right away. Um, and this is a question uh, from Michael Hofer, who is asking which specific points in the evolving patient journey is DKSH focusing on? And how are we focusing on these? Okay, excellent. I can I can take that. And again, Michael, thanks for for your question. So I mean, we we basically are looking at this in a in a three phase manner, right? I mean, the first phase of it is, is the more traditional patient solution, uh, patient adherence programs that that are the most fundamental as we look at you know the majority of the programs that are being designed today uh, to to be able to address some needs. So DKSH obviously has a as a PSP cloud platform that we are utilizing as our backbone. Based on based on that, we can actually build to provide solutions that are catered to the needs of our, our various clients. The the second element of it, which is which is more important around the uh, the monitoring, I think that element is a is a very very critical element that we are also looking towards. Uh, it's a mix of you know whether it's wearables, it's devices, it's apps, it's platforms, uh, biomarkers, uh, you know things that kind of give surrogates that actually can help the the healthcare providers improve the treatment decisions for these patients and provide the, the real world evidence and the data that everyone's looking for and, and thus allow for us to report those outcomes. And then, and then phase three would be, you know, uh, the elements I was alluding to a few minutes ago, which is patient education, convenience, how do you interface with the payment providers, insurance providers, government institutions? I think these are all elements that help in the long-term sustainability, particularly from a chronic treatment perspective. So DKSH is actually working with a variety of uh, different uh, you know, partners uh, along this entire continuum of care. And the, and the end product is, again, provide the access, provide the adherence, and the convenience to the patients. Sheena? Okay, great. Um, I, we have a couple of minutes left. Um, the other questions are very specifically directed at homage as well. Um, so maybe, Jillian, if you just have a second to reply, um, what are the areas of chronic condition expertise that you have? And also, what is the mechanism that you employ to gather the expert panels? Sure, yeah. So I think what's driving a predominant amount of use, uh, you know, engagement on our platform is um, 80, over 80% 80 is driven by, uh, you know, those living with chronic conditions. And we see the top ones are uh, you know, Parkinson's, stroke, hypertension, heart failure, um, oncological cases, so, so, so cancer, and, uh, you know, very much, uh, of course, uh, on the neuro end, uh, Alzheimer's and dementia. So, so d diabetes comes in in a, a, a close six. And for those, um, we, we do see, you know, I think I really um, take on sort of Jerome and Varun's points on, on, just the it's there's no one size fits all data is absolutely important there's this movement of you know rather than looking at uh, uh, a a reactive kind of uh, uh, stance to to its dealing with these chronic conditions there's more active management more data using data as well as predictive elements moving more towards reactivity to predictivity uh, prediction excuse me so and and that is you know very much driving um, that consumer directedness uh, and, and providing that kind of solution um, that uh, individuals are looking for that's very specific to them because every primary caregiving unit is different. Every family unit is different. So very much so for those living, it's also uh, tied to these stages and how nascent or advanced they are in their journeys with these uh, chronic conditions and uh, which really ties back to the topic today, and I think that's you know uh, ex extremely relevant. And I do want to, I guess, rounding up comments is to thank uh, DKSH as well as uh, the team here in Varun uh, for the opportunity to to share some of uh, Homage's uh, progress as well as experiences. So thank you very thank much. You very much.
Thank, Thank you, you Julian. Julian. I'll hand over to Varun to say the final words and close the session today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sheena. And again, I want to thank our um, our three panelists. Uh, so Jillian, uh, Jerome, as well as Michelle, thank you for taking the time and joining us uh, for this discussion and sharing, uh, you know, your respective thoughts on, on homage, uh, the patient centric approach, as well as Talus. We really appreciate it. And again, I want to thank the audience for taking your, uh, your R and, and coming and joining us for our first patient solution webinar. Uh, please look out for more. I'm sure the team's going to be putting out a series of this, and we look forward to more interactivity with you in the future. So thank you again, and um, wish you all uh, stay safe and, and have a great rest of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.